Hi everyone, I'm Anya Parampil and you're watching Redlines. Reports recently surfaced of a draft military and trade deal negotiated between China and Iran. The New York Times warns the deal would, quote, vastly extend China's influence in the Middle East, throwing Iran an economic lifeline and creating new flashpoints with the United States. So what exactly drove Tehran and Beijing closer, and what will the implications of this deal be for the region of Western Asia as well as the entire world? To find out, I spoke with Beijing-based journalist Ian Goodrum. Ian Goodrum, welcome to Red Lines. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start by asking you what exactly led Iran and China to make this new historic agreement? Well, we first have to, to be aware that, that the, the thing that, that's been talked about in most of the press in the last uh, week and a half or so is based on a draft. Uh, we don't actually know what this deal really entails because it hasn't been finalized yet. Um, but the, the draft shows us that there is a plan of some sort for a uh, for an intensified and and stronger cooperation between the two countries, um, and and as far as what led to this, it, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. Uh, the U.S. has put Iran under a brutal sanctions regime for many many years, uh, on the spurious claims that Iran was developing a nuclear weapon, uh, when the evidence for that was pretty flimsy, and and now just because they claim that Iran hasn't held up their end of the the nuclear agreement, even though they by all independent estimations have done so. Uh, they they followed every protocol. They they did everything correctly, but the Trump administration still withdrew and put down new sanctions, new unilateral sanctions on Iran, which just like most sanctions, um, cripples an economy, keeps essential goods from flowing into the country. Uh, the U.S. in particular, when it imposes sanctions, because the U.S. dollar is the foundation of most international financial transactions, uh, you you find it very difficult to to do any kind of trade between countries if the U.S. has put these kinds of sanctions on you. So because of this and because Europe criticized the U.S. whenever the U.S. withdrew from the agreement because they were also party to the agreement, several European countries were, and they said that they would they would attempt to continue to trade with Iran and, and do business with Iran, they have been dragging their feet. They have, they have been chilled out essentially by the, the threat of, of the consequences of sanctions and, and of the U.S. imposing sanctions on them, which it very well could do for, for perceived violations. So, and, and I mean, the, the, the best indication of, of this possibility is, for example, the, the much publicized case of the Huawei phone uh, telecoms company and, and, and software hardware company based in China. The CFO, Meng Wanzhou, was detained uh, when her plane landed in Canada, and and the reason why she's being detained and why the U.S. is demanding that she be extradited is because Huawei allegedly did business with Iran uh, during the sanctions period, and so for the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad crime of doing business with Iran, uh, while the the U.S. has imposed these these brutal sanctions and and getting around these sanctions that keep medical equipment away from people during a pandemic. Uh, I believe the sanctions were intensified actually during the COVID pandemic, which makes things obviously worse. Uh, the, 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 this, this containment, this encirclement of Iran, uh, any, any breach, any attempt to uh, break it and, and, to, and to get people in Iran what they need and, and create a trade relationship that would benefit the country and, and help the, the people of the country um, is looked on very harshly as evidenced by this case, this Huawei case. So with Europe not doing its part, like it said it would after the U.S. withdrew, with the U.S. brutalizing the people of Iran with sanctions, China is the best option for, for Iran, obviously. I don't, I don't see what other alternative there is. So with that in mind, this is where this deal comes from. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. rumored to be a 25-year partnership uh, to the tune of something like $400 billion. It's in dispute whether that's the reality. Again, this is a draft that people are talking about. But it, it's not hard to see why this is being considered. China has the, the economic strength. It has the, the size. It has the, the industry to, to provide the things that, that Iranians need. And so this is a way of getting around these, uh, these unilateral sanctions. It's a way of normalizing economic relationships with Iran. 
uh, if China is is creates this partnership, it's possible that Europe might see that it, it can be done. Um, there there going there will have to be a way to get around the dollar regime, which, which has been right. endlessly. Yeah. There's a lot to do. Yeah. Th that's a theme I've seen coming up in media outlets worldwide from the South China Morning Post to even the Financial Times talking about how U.S. sanction policy is really driving a rejection of U.S. dollar hegemony. So I'm wondering what exactly you think this agreement would signify in terms of a new era in the political dynamics of Western Asia. Well, I mean, I think I think most people outside of the U.S. and, and the Anglosphere realize just how unfair and just how brutal the treatment of Iran has been by the United States. That's a fact pretty much universally acknowledged in the global south and outside of the power base of the United States. And so China stepping up and saying, we're, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're not going to be cowed by these sanctions. We're not going to be chilled out by these sanctions the way some other countries have. Um, we're going to we're going to have a normal relationship with this country because it's a normal country. Um, it, it's a, it's it's a bigger part of what what President Xi has talked about when he says South South cooperation, meaning cooperation among nations of the global South. It's it's an it's an explicit policy of the Chinese government to to improve relations with countries that have been historically subjugated, uh, previous colonial subjects in in South America and Africa and other continents, um, trying to build. Uh, an alternative system to the kind of the, as you say, the dollar hegemony or the, the economic hegemony of the U.S., which has been for a long time a vehicle by which resources can be extracted, um, labor differentials can be exploited, uh, and, and the, the, maintain, the maintenance of this, this domination would continue. China is offering an alternative to this and saying that we, we will we do our best to, be, we want to make this legal. We, we don't want to be punished and so they're figuring out ways to get around it but I mean doing so marks marks a big shift it, it marks um, it, this is the this is the commitment to the the stated goals of the south south cooperation policy it's it is it is essentially putting money where one's mouth is so I think people are countries and people are going to be taking a great deal of notice not least of which the United States which has already come out against this and and said it's oh it's a terrible horrible thing that um, a country is not bending to our uh, unilateral brutal sanction regime. So, and it really is, it really is a global issue. You you can see that in the way, for example, China has come to the assistance of Venezuela in, in South America, delivering tons and tons of medical supplies throughout this coronavirus outbreak. In spite of the fact the United States is still speaking in the language of the Monroe period saying that Venezuela is in our backyard, there still seems to be a shift going on globally here. Reuters recently reported that the United States is considering a blanket ban on travel to the U.S. for all members of the Chinese Communist Party. What would the impact of such a measure such as this be? Well, we'll see if it actually happens. I have my doubts. But the, the thing about this is, I mean, when people talk about the Communist Party of China, they don't really have a full picture of what that means. I mean, even people that have lived in China don't really. There, there's this there's this desire, just as there is a desire to paint the entire country of China as a monolith. There's a desire to paint the Communist Party of China as a monolith, as a as a party that is only the the top leadership, and and not the 90 million people that are in it. It's, you know, nearly you know nearly 10 percent of the population of the country, and. When you're talking about the membership with the CPC, you're talking about people that are, by, by their vocation, by official numbers, by the party's own count, you're talking about people that are mostly uh, frontline workers, farmers, fishermen, herdsmen, students, retirees, um, ordinary people. You know, I mean, if you live here, you will, and you know, I see this all the time, you'll, you'll be going through a subway station, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, um, you know, you'll you'll see a, a custodian of some kind, and they'll have the Communist Party pin on their on their clothes or their uniform, indicating that they're a member. This is a this is a, a proposed travel ban that would affect 90 million people and their families, and and there's been estimates that that would, in turn, because it's it's targeted not just at members but also relations to members, about 270 million people. 
So it's unlike I, I I have my doubts as to whether it actually happened. The other, I mean, the other thing is I don't think anybody in China is really itching to go to the United States right now, anyway. So I don't know what real effect it would have, even if it were put in place. But it's um, it, it's part and parcel of this this desire to create an opposition between the Communist Party and the rest of the country. When in reality, the party is the country. Um, it, 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 it is a broad spectrum of people. The central leadership itself most, mostly come from backgrounds of, of working class or um, you know, they come from a family of, of agricultural workers because of the nature of the country and the nature of its development. So it, it's, this, it's this creation of an opposition, which is, which is a constant theme. This idea that the party is ruling over the country and not it's not among the people, it doesn't have the people in mind, all these all these claims that don't really bear fruit because the 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 grassroots party organizations have been a big part of China's poverty alleviation campaign that has led to hundreds of millions of people getting out of poverty. Uh, this is a this is something that's unprecedented. And it's happened because the party is at that base level, able to listen to the people's concerns and respond. So this I, again, this 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 travel ban is a means of of creating bolstering this narrative that that if you if you really know how the party works in practice, you know that it, it's nothing further, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. So they can try to to do this. I I, I have my doubts as to whether they will. I mean, they they attempted to not specifically target China with this um, visa measure against international students. But it affected Chinese international students more than anybody else, and and that was eventually withdrawn. I think there's going to be a great deal of of pressure uh, if this is if this is proposed. I think the idea uh, the travel bans against the the Muslim countries that was that was uh, pushed in 2017 got a great deal of pushback. Uh, we'll see if this gets a similar reaction. I think it probably will. I just think it's important you raise the the issue of what the Chinese Communist Party truly is because. In U.S. media, it's always presented as though this ban just targets or would only target officials or businessmen. And so I, I think it's key that you've, you've really broken down who it truly represents. Washington did recently strip Hong Kong of its special trading status with the United States in response to the implementation of a new national security law in the region. Why did China establish this law and what misconceptions do you feel people in the United States may have about it? Well, the basic reason why it was established is because it was it was called for in the basic law of the country, which is the the country's legal document that that goes along with the PRC constitution in in terms of being the overall constitution of of the Hong Kong special administrative region. Yeah, it's it's a it's a region of China, but it has a great deal of autonomy as laid out in the basic law and the constitution. It maintains its own capitalist system. It maintains its own legal system, and this has been the foundation for. Um, Hong Kong being sort of the window between the mainland and the rest of the world in terms of financial transactions um, and, and overall business. So the basic law, an article of the basic law, clearly states that, that Hong Kong needs, a, needs legislation related to national security. This, was in, this became the law of the region in 1997 when Hong Kong was returned from, from Britain to China. And in that time, in that 23 years, there hasn't been the law. It just hasn't existed. It hasn't been legislated, despite the fact that the basic law calls for it explicitly. And so, and, and there was an attempt in 2003, but it, it got a great deal of pushback and uh, was eventually shelved. But the the issues kept popping up. The the issues of of kind of well, how do we define national security? How do we define violations of national security? How do we how do we you know what? What's the what's the legal response? What's the criminal justice response? Like these questions keep coming up, especially in recent years when you've got um, when you've got these, as they're termed in the West, pro democracy protesters. In reality, they are. Um, well, I mean, it's a mixed bag. You can't really characterize them all or paint them all with the same brush. But there have been quite a few inc instances of violence. Uh, there was a, there were a couple of famous cases where. An elderly man, 70 years old, uh, a custodian was hit with a brick by one of the protesters and later died. There was a man who was set on fire because he said, we are all Chinese. There have been these instances of very, very bad. They were attacking violence. police in the way that you would never see happen in the United States. Right. Well, there's been an attempt to to compare kind of the, 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 the Hong Kong police to the U.S. police in response to the George Floyd protests. But as we've seen, 
the tactics that the Hong Kong protesters use wouldn't work in the U.S. because the U.S. police would just immediately brutalize them and crack down, whereas the Hong Kong police are a little more tolerant of that sort of thing. Which is not to say there hasn't been police violence in Hong Kong. Of course there has. But um, but it's certainly uh, to a degree less severe than we've seen. You know, I, I don't know how many dozens of people have already been killed um, or, or maimed. So the law itself is not that remarkable. There's been some attempts to take certain clauses or sections of the law and blow them out of proportion and say they're doing this thing or that thing, but it's based on a very willful misreading of the law. Uh, and, and these and these kind of doom and gloom prognostications were happening before the law was even released, before people even knew what it was going to say. There was already pronouncements about Hong Kong is dead, this is the end of one country, two systems, which is which means which is the, the basic kind of phrase that describes how the governance of Hong Kong works. China is one country, but there are two separate systems comparing the, the special administrative regions and the mainland. Um, the interesting thing is that, that Macau, the other special administrative region, has had a national security law on the books since 2009, very similar to, to the law in, that, that is in place in Hong Kong. And yet there has not been the same level of wailing and gnashing of teeth about Macau's, Macau's national security law. So it's interesting to see the kind of uh, the, the cognitive dissonance taking place when when you're talking about this law as if it is the the apocalypse. But there but there are quite a few reasons for it. One of which is just the constitutionality of the necessity of the law. But then you also had this this these protests in in the last few years that have turned violent, and and that have turned you know that have intensified with the help of the United States and other other countries which have. Uh, if not directly, have indirectly trained and funded some of the leaders of the protest and have been pushing, you know, sub- giving their own support um, to these these people, many of whom are, are not all, again, but, but many of whom are separatists who want independent Hong Kong, um, who can't stand Ch- uh, Chinese sovereignty as a concept. And so there's, it, it's, very, it's a very messy situation. And so the idea of the national security law is to kind of get things back to an even keel. And the majority of Hong Kongers actually support it, no? Yeah, there was a there was a petition signing that took place. I want to say in in the days just after the law was passed, of people being able to 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 come by and sign and show their support, and it was several million. I think nearly half of the the whole country's population signing the petition. So I mean, if that's if that's who actually gets out and signs a petition, you can imagine how many people actually support the bill. It, it's it the 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 protest click has gotten smaller and smaller as time has gone on because they've turned off the the greater population to to their their aims and through their tactics they've they have lost i don't know that they ever had but they certainly if they did they've lost i think majority support mm-hmm. um so it's it's an interesting situation where you've got you've got a small group of protesters that are that are claiming to represent the wishes of the people but then you've got people that are saying no we actually like the the law and um, those protests keep getting smaller and smaller, and as they get smaller, they get more violent. And so, we'll see what happens in the future. But um, it's clear that they're they're acting not on behalf of the population of Hong Kong, but they're acting on behalf of of maybe certain groups in other countries that would like to see uh, that would like to see China weakened or broken up um, over these issues of sovereignty. So uh, that's what the law helps to do to to stamp down on. China recently retaliated to U.S. hostility, announcing sanctions targeting U.S. arms manufacturer Lockheed Martin, as well as U.S. officials, including Mark Rubio and Ted Cruz. And China decides to take essential measures, so uh, we will impose sanctions on the main contractor of this arms sale, Lockheed Martin. Why do you believe China took this action and what will its effects be? Well, we're still waiting to see what the what the sanctions will entail, but um, but the specific reasoning for it was because the U.S. government and Lockheed Martin, as the supplier, have been continuously making arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, there's there's what's called a one China policy that that governs the cross straits relations and and the the international situation as far as China's sovereignty over Taiwan is concerned. And the one China principle essentially states that that there you know there is one China, and and that's the that's the consensus that has been reached between um, the mainland and and the island of Taiwan, 
And so the U.S. officially recognizes only the PRC as China, and that's why it has a seat in the United Nations. That's why it's on the Security Council, because it is the, the official representative of China to the U.N. and in practically all international bodies. So to sell arms to Taiwan is a provocation. It's, it's, it's essentially saying that we, we technically obey the letter of the law in terms of recognizing the PRC, but we also want to sell weapons to Taiwan because we want to sell weapons. And, and Lockheed Martin is the supplier, and they make a great deal of money off these sales. So by essentially targeting the most vocally anti-China politicians in the U.S. and the weapons manufacturer that is chiefly responsible for sending these arms to Taiwan in, in violation of, of this principle and in violation of, of the official recognized sovereignty of, of who, which government holds uh, is representative of China, which includes Taiwan, um, doing so is, yeah, it, it is meant only to, to provoke. It's meant only to stir up um, anger and resentment and, and, and irritation. It's the same. It's the same reason why the U.S. sends warships into the South China Sea. Uh, it's it, it's it's all about kind of trying to provoke a reaction, which can then be uh, selectively focused on in the media and in, in government communications to say that China is being belligerent and more like and all this stuff. Well, if you if you if you send warships into the South China Sea and China says, okay, well we're going to do a patrol of our own. And then you only report on China's patrol. Well, then you can make China look like the aggressor when in reality it's only responding. So same deal here, right? That This has been going on for a very long time. There's been many arms sales to Taiwan under the Trump administration and under previous administrations. It's China said, we're, we're, we're done. We've had enough of this. We're not going to just sit by and let this continue to happen. So this is the response. So it's true that uh, sanctions from, uh, from a major economic power like the U.S. on, on countries like Iran brutalize and and uh, immiserate the people in those countries, but sanctions from China on an arms dealer, not so much. Uh, they'll, they will, um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, the, the, real, the real punch that these sanctions would have is if China decided to start um, making conditions on on who and 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 to what use their rare earth materials uh, are sent china has a, a a very great amount of of the rare earth minerals that are necessary for a lot of high-tech manufacturing and weapons manufacturing um there are there are deposits in other places but china has a a very high concentration of of the facilities and infrastructure needed to to process the raw materials and so through that, there there is possibility in terms of, of giving these sanctions against Lockheed Martin teeth because Lockheed Martin relies on, on those raw materials to produce its own its own arms. Uh, we'll see if that actually happens. That would be a very big step. I think right now, the proposed sanctions are just a warning. Um, we'll we'll see if we'll see if there's there's more of a punch to them. But I mean, the the I don't think there's been too much false equivalency drawn between sanctions on Lockheed Martin again, a weapons manufacturer, uh, a, a merchant of death. Uh, and sanctions from the U.S. on Venice, places like Venezuela, Cuba, Iran. There, it's a world of difference. And, and as I put it, um, sanctions on Lockheed Martin are, to me, one of the only good sanctions you could possibly do. Certainly checks out logically. I suppose if only we could see more weapons manufacturers canceled, I think that would be <laughs> a good thing. Yeah, that's that's cancel culture I can get behind 100%. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Yeah, if we, if we cancel too. Raytheon, if we cancel Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, I'm all for it. A lot of D.C. and Northern Virginia might be out of business, but too bad. Maybe we should find some some other industries to fuel our economy. China is currently battling a surge of coronavirus cases in the western province of Xinjiang. Western media is currently framing the outbreak as though Beijing has declared war on its Muslim population. This, of course, follows months of reporting claiming that China is keeping millions of Muslims in concentration camps in the region without supplying any evidence to back those accusations. What is your understanding of the situation there? Well, it's like any of the it's like any of the new clusters that have formed in China since the, since the major outbreak was was largely contained. The major outbreak taking place mostly in Wuhan and Hubei province. Um, yeah, the the Xinjiang cases. There's about 40 right now. I think 17 of them are symptomatic and 23 are asymptomatic. So already, I think it's it's already well on the way of being contained there. Um, we. 
as as I'm sure you know, we had a we had our own outbreak here in Beijing. There was a there was a period in mid June where there were new cases being found, largely related to this wholesale agricultural market, and so the process was very similar to what's going on in Xinjiang right now. It, I mean, this is the thing. It's 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 a perfectly ordinary uh, epidemic containment procedures. Okay, you you mandate masks again. And the the, the interesting thing is. Living in Beijing, you actually saw the the difference. It was like night and day, basically, because in in early June, when the the public health emergency levels were lowered and and the situation was 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 getting back to normal, you saw you saw you still saw masks in the street. I still wore my mask, but you saw people without them, and they were no longer mandated. So some people stopped wearing them. But in June, but on June eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, when these new cases in Beijing were first announced. Boom! It was it was like a switch had been flipped. It was night and day. Everybody everybody was back to wearing masks all the time, um, and and everybody was back to doing temperature checks everywhere, um, contact tracing, tracing like writing down when you get when you get temperature scanned, uh, showing your 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 health code. You know, it was a very big shift immediately. People complied too. Like it's it's not like what's happening in the U.S. where you got people saying wearing a mask is communism. Um, and so it, it was contained very fast. It, we were, I, I believe, I haven't checked today because it's, it's fairly early in the morning. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done my daily, um, has there been a new case in Beijing check, but at least yesterday we were coming up on almost two weeks without any new cases, any new symptomatic cases transmitted locally. So, And that's with massive testing in place. Yeah. Well, testing, of course, is, is the biggest thing. Beijing upped its testing infrastructure going from being able to- Because here we're told more tests equals more cases. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, with the Beijing went from, from being able to test about 100,000 people a day to a million people a day, and they've tested almost 12 million people last I checked. They were not regularly updated on, on, on that, but the last time they gave an update, the health commission gave an update, it was uh, many, many millions of people have been tested in just a few weeks. So that was that was a big part of it. You know, the the- Anybody associated with the wholesale market was tested. Anybody in the food and beverage industry was tested because the wholesalers provided a lot of material produce for restaurants. Um, there was, it was later found out not to be the case, but there was a belief that that it, it the the virus only came through on on cutting boards uh, for salmon. So salmon was off the shelves immediately, within a day of the of the the first dozen or so cases being announced. The response is very fast. So in Xinjiang, the same thing is happening. Um, this, this, there's been a deliberate, this, this happened uh, in a few places because some places went under what are called wartime measures, but that's just a level, that's just a level of containment. It doesn't mean that, that the population is at war with the government or that there's martial law. It simply means that there is a, it's, it's a lockdown like what happened in, in parts of Hubei province and in Wuhan. You, the household to household visits are, are not allowed for, for a temporary period. Um, there's, the no large gatherings, mask wearing, you know, it's suggested that you keep your trips outside to just getting essential supplies. I don't believe Xinjiang is at the level where, like in Wuhan, people just stayed home and couldn't leave and they got supplies delivered to them by their local community workers, their party members or their the, the actual residential community workers who are government workers. Um, you, you saw some videos of, of people in full PPE dropping off big, big, bags of vegetables and, and things people needed for the day um, or, or for the week if it was a weekly delivery system. So when, when there's a very disingenuous attempt to say, well, because this is called wartime measures, which is just which just shows how seriously the problem is being taken, even with only 40 cases, they're using that to say that that China is at war with Xinjiang. This this feeds into another narrative that's been pushed about about this idea of, of Xinjiang being a, a place that's under under that's been under lock and key and, and all these terrible things are happening. Um, this is just like what happened in Hubei and Hubei is now has not reported a new case. I think it'll be the same you know, as Beijing. There will be there will be a week or so of of cases coming in as people get tested and then testing will expand. And eventually the cases will will shrink and then become nothing because you've you've locked it down, you've tested everybody that needs to be tested, and you've got a handle on who has the virus and who doesn't, and you're treating those who do or isolating those who do and are not showing symptoms. 
and isolating practically everybody, depending on how severe the lockdown is. This is a normal measure. This is exactly what was taken all over the, these are exactly the measures that were taken all over the country. There's nothing distinguishing what's happening in Xinjiang from everywhere else. And in fact, when the outbreak was, was at its peak in China in February, there were some alarmist kind of apocalyptic pronouncements again. Um, the, the, the China watcher community, the China experts um, who get employed by think tanks and, and, and Western journalism outlets and, and uh, State Department cutouts um, were saying this is going to be really, really bad in Xinjiang. It's going to be so terrible because, um, because the Chinese government will weaponize this virus against a population that it's, that, it's a, that, you know, that it's doing all these bad things to. And then it turned out that Xinjiang and Tibet, actually, were two of the, 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 the regions of China that had the fewest cases. Uh, so this idea of, of this, this kind of um, supremacist uh, uh, genocidal treatment of, of these ethnic minority groups through the virus that was being pushed by some scaremongers uh, was totally wrong. And it was the opposite, in fact. It was it, the Xinjiang and Tibet were some of the first places to open back up and, and had some of the fewest cases. So this new cluster that's showing up it's going to be like Beijing. And in fact, the numbers are right now less severe than Beijing. So I think it'll take even less time to contain it. And then, you know, if we lived in a society where people um, admitted when they were wrong and, and didn't get funded and, and supported by the U.S. state and media apparatuses, they would be eating crow. But everyone will just kind of pretend they never said what they said and move on and, and they will continue to be treated as experts. It goes back to that theme of trying to to exacerbate divisions within China and and speak as though different regions are treated with with special gloves or or really just an effort to to encourage the balkanization of China as we saw with what happened in Hong Kong. Finally, Ian, I'm just wondering as someone from the West who now lives in Beijing and and you're living there really during the beginning of what many believe will be a, a very intense Cold War initiated largely from the United States against China, tensions getting more uh, heightened and, and hostile than ever before. What would you like people in the West to understand about China based on your experience there? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> can I give you a list? Um <laughs> Uh, it's, it's hard, it's hard to pick, it's hard to pick one or two things. Um, I mean, it's like I said about when I was talking about the communist party, that this idea that, that China is not really a monolith, even though that's the attempt, there's, there's lots of attempts to paint it as such, but China is very diverse ethnically, culturally, geographically. Um, you, you go to one part of China, it looks absolutely nothing like the other. There's most people, when they come here, they come to Beijing or Shanghai, they, they go to the East coast where most of the population is. So they get one idea. Of, of what China is. And I mean, they're great cities. There's lots to see and do. I love Beijing. I li I've been living here for two years. I, I don't have any plans to leave, especially not right now. Um, but uh, So you, you can, you can get a false impression. You can, you can think, you can think that it's monolithic, even if you've been here, but you, you gotta, you know, you gotta go out to central China, to Western China. You gotta go out to the rural areas and see how different it can be. Um, so there's that. Uh, and I mean, also, this idea that China is this aggressive um, actor on the world stage, that, that, that it's this belligerent, um, this belligerent warlike nation that is provoking everybody and, and doing all these very scary things. Well, it's like I, we're talking about the South China Sea. We're talking about, um, uh, talking about most China-related issues. Oftentimes, the, a reaction to a provocation is treated as a provocation. Uh, so, I mean, I encourage people to to get context, to get to get better context of, of these situations, to not just. And I understand why this happens. We're busy. There's a lot going on right now. You know, we got our lives to live. I understand. Uh, but and, and so it's not easy to kind of to to take a more active approach to media consumption and, and to and to think more broadly and, and more critically about what we consume. Because. You know, there's lots of problems in the U.S. right now, and so reading reading the media, it is kind of a passive in one ear and out the other process where you internalize a lot of a lot of these narratives. And I would encourage people to to seek a broader um, perspective on on any country, but but especially countries like China that are 
clearly being targeted, where tensions are clearly being ramped up deliberately, deliberately where there's clear efforts to, to weaken and break up the country and its relationships with other countries, too. Um, just, just, yeah, I mean, just don't believe everything you read. Uh, and, and it's, it's tough to, to be an active consumer as opposed to a passive consumer, but it's worth trying. So that would be the, that would be the big thing. I mean, just, and and I mean, one ties into the other, right? Because this idea of a monolithic China ties in with an aggressive China because if China's a monolith, then it, it acts as, it acts as, as one, as one aggressive being as opposed to being a uh, you know very diverse um very interesting complicated place where there's lots of factors at play and 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 there are lots of lots of lots of things going on so i would i would say probably those two but again yeah if if you gave me if you know if we had an hour just to talk about that man there would be a lot to cover so i'll leave it there well you're a great source of a broader perspective but you've You've advised people to seek. So, where can viewers find your work? Where can they follow you? Um, I'm mostly Twitter is is the social media that I use. So that's on um, I S Goodrum on Twitter. Uh, I write for China Daily. So I, I I haven't been putting out columns lately because there's been a there's it, it's been busy. Uh, <laughs> there's been there's been other work to do. But um, I try to get a column out with some regularity. I write in China Daily, and then usually what um, What's in China Daily gets out to People's World in the U.S. So, so those are the two places where I, I primarily write for. So you can check you can check there. And uh, and and I mean those I think those are I think those are good publications too. Um, not just because they publish me, but because I think they they do provide that perspective um, in the U.S. and in China. I think so. Those are worthwhile sources just in general to check out. Ian Goodrum, thanks so much for joining Redlines and bringing that perspective that we so badly need in the United States. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.